Well, let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to Genesis. We've made our way to turn the page, as it were, to chapter 2. We're finally past uh, the first chapter of Genesis. If you've been here with us for the time, if you're, this is your first time or first time here in a while, uh, since the beginning of the year, we have been slowly making our way through the earliest parts of the book of Genesis as we look at Genesis as, as the series is entitled, It's a Matter of Faith. This is not only what we should do, we believe this, but it is establishing key principles in our relationship with God and how we understand Him and how we understand the world that has been shaped around us. The message this morning, if you're looking on the back of your bulletin, the outline is accurate this week, uh, and so we're grateful for that. Uh, but that is, the message is entitled, Two Versions of the Same Story. Two Versions of the Same Story. You'll notice that as we start our way through this passage, we're not going to read all of chapter 2 today, but there is a distinct contrast between what we've read in chapter 1, breaking down the days and what was created on each day. And it seems like, if you read at first glance, some have, have observed that it doesn't do it in quite the same fashion. It, instead of saying this was made this day, this was made this day, there is a difference. And some have actually, skeptics have said, this shows that maybe there's something different going on here. Maybe uh, what we see in chapter 1 was the original creation and then there was a reset button somewhere, somehow. Uh, some people say this, this gives an indication that there are different authors and that what we see in Genesis is maybe a compilation of various perspectives that are, are being melded together and maybe not a very good fashion, uh, so to speak, they might say. Uh, I don't think that that's what's happening here, and I'm going to try to lead you to understand that should not be how you understand it either. These two accounts are not in competition with each other. They are two versions of the same story, as we've entitled the message. The, what you see happening in this passage is the first one is talking about how God creates the world and everything in it, creates the universe. But chapter 2, very specifically, helps us understand what he created the universe for. And I would even maybe say who he created the universe for. We'll see that uh, play itself out here for us and see what our world looks like through the lens of Genesis chapter 2 as we read verses 4 through 6. So let's put our attention there and read this passage together. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the, heaven, made the earth and the heavens. And so that's a little bit of a contrast that gives us that right there. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord made the earth and the heavens, and there's something that we'll see playing itself out there in that contrast. Verse 5, when no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. That's where we'll stop here this morning. What I want to help you understand as we build to this conclusion that God created the world for his glory because of human, or to give uh, a venue for human productivity, we see, first of all, that God is establishing life here in this passage. God is establishing life, and I'm talking particularly not about all of life, but he is establishing our life. He's establishing human life. As we've already mentioned there, that you see these are the generations of the heavens and the earth, the day when the Lord made the earth and the heavens. There's a little bit of a difference there, and it's because he's helping us to see how this is a shift in perspective. In chapter 1, he starts with the heavens. He starts with the earth. He starts with the material. Now he's helping us to understand more from the ground level from what it looks like to look at it from where we are, instead of from God's perspective in the heavens and the earth. Now we're looking at it from a human perspective, from the earth and the heavens. 
It's also an interesting thing there where you see this switch in perspective as God is establishing life, that what he's talking about there in verse 4, these are the generations, these are the generations. He's helping us to see what that perspective looks like as far as how this plays out. It's almost like a genealogy of the earth. And so that's the first blank under where it says God establishes life if you're following along. There's a difference in the perspective here. And so like when he starts listing later on in Genesis where we have genealogies or other places or you see that in the, the Kings and Chronicles or even later on in the New Testament where those names are listed. Even what Troy just showed us. By the way, Troy, did you know that Mayor Shalal Hashbaz, which is, I suppose, like you say, a name that the, the pastors can pronounce. It's a little bit of a trivia point there. That's actually the longest name in the English Bible for you. So if, if you have, that ever comes up in Bible trivia, what's the longest name in the English Bible? It's Mayor Shalal Hashbaz. So there it is. <laughs> That's a little bit extra. That was not in the sermon outline. Uh, but what you have going on in genealogies is they're trying to trace the way that things descended. This person is connected with this person. It's establishing time. It's establishing things like uh, a date reference and that kind of thing. But it's also, especially for the Jewish mind and now for our mind as we read through, helping us understand that God makes promises and he is seeing those fulfilled in an unbroken way. And so to the point where in the New Testament where you see Jesus and his ancestry, his genealogy is traced all the way back to Adam in one sense, and one, all the way back to Abraham and David in another genealogy. It's helping us understand God makes his promises. God keeps his promises. But he's also helping us understand where things came from. And so in the Hebrew where he says, these are the generations, this is how it all plays out. It's also an interesting thing in the Hebrew, what's What's the first man's name who's going to be created here? We should know this. We haven't come across it in the text yet, but who's the first man? Adam. So, it's an interesting thing that in the Hebrew, the word for ground is Adama. And so, Adam is taken from Adama. That is, he is made, we're going to see this next week, he's shaped from the dust of the ground. And so there's something that's happening here that's a difference in our perspective. In chapter 1, we might say it this way, the word of the Lord is what speaks everything into existence. God said, let there be light. And what does Genesis 1 say? There was light. God says, let this happen, and it happens. God speaks, and things are created. We talked a little bit about that being ex nihilo, creating out of nothing. He just speaks these things, into existence. It's the foundation of creation. He's establishing these things. But now, the word of the Lord is going to be seen as something different in chapter 2. The word of the Lord is not speaking things into existence. As we work our way through the chapter, we're going to see these are going to be the word of the Lord and giving us directions and instructions that are meant to be followed, meant to be obeyed. And what we also will see as things continue, humanity fails to heed the commands. And we see little hints of that in the verses that we've read. And so in verse 5, when there is no bush of the field yet in the land, no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. This is where skeptics have focused and say, see, this is different. God's creating man and creating human beings out of the dust of the earth but this doesn't fall in sequence with what you see, because you, you see God creating plant matter, and then he creates humanity. But now he's saying, see, plant matter is being, hasn't been created yet, but he's creating people. That doesn't line up. There's, there's something different going on. They're right, there is something different going on, but it's not that plants haven't been created. What we're seeing here is the potential that humanity is going to bring to God's creation. God is creating life. God has established life. We're giving a different perspective, but he's showing us the potential of humanity. And that's the next point on your outline. That potential that shows us that though God created the world, God created the earth, before it could really flourish under God's blessing, 
he had to create people. So what's going on with the bush of the field? This is an anticipation of what's going to happen after the fall, after the curse. The bush of the field is in reference, we, we would say in this understanding, to a, a shrub, a, something that you read about later on in Genesis, for example, when Abraham makes the connection with Hagar, they have Ishmael, and Hagar and Ishmael flee into the wilderness, and they take shelter under a bush of the field. It's the same word here. It's a shrub. They, they find a shelter. It's something that's large enough to give them a little bit of, uh, of obstacle to get under a shadow from the heat, to get a little bit of protection, however mere it might have been. It's that kind of scale. And you think about some of the, the things. We live out over here off of 18th, kind of in the neighborhood of Essex Park, and we can walk from our house over to Essex Park. And when we walk through some of those trails, it's different. I have to keep the kids, don't, don't walk in the field right now because I don't want you to track all those ashes into the house because they just burned all the fields. Why are they burning the fields? They're trying to kill off some of the growth and some of the weeds that come out of there and maybe make some space for new growth. But you've seen what wildflowers and what plants can look like. They can get fairly large. And that's something that's, that's going on here. He's making reference to what's going to happen after the fall. What changes when the earth is cursed? What does he say that Adam and Eve are going to have to deal with now? The thorns and thistles. The things that, the, the weeds that are going to have to be worked through. God's created plants, and that's not inconsistent with what he's saying here, but he's saying it's before the ground has been cursed. The bush of the field is the plant of the field. It's anticipating what's going to happen after the change. The small plants that it talks about here in the ESV, or if you have uh, King James, it might say something like the herb of the field. That's anticipating not the kind of plants that were necessary for the sustenance of life, the seed-bearing plants that we read about in chapter 1. Rather, it's talking about as you can even see from the context here, that the small plant of the field has not sprung up because the Lord God, verse 5, has not caused it to rain on the land. There's another indicator of what's yet to come. And there was no man to work the ground. And so what are the small plants here? They're the things that we even see, or we will see here, Lord willing, in a few weeks or months, when the plant fields start getting cultivated, the fields start getting planted with soybeans, with corn, with other things like this that we use to survive, but we're not there in the beginning of creation being cultivated, being tilled in such a way. There was all kinds of fruit and, and natural things in, in abundance in the early creation, but it didn't require humanity to keep it up to thrive. The crops that God created for them to live on, though that needed the ground to be worked, that needed uh, human attention and care, which again, it's important for us to understand that's what God made humanity to do even before the fall. What's he put in the garden? We're going to see that in succeeding weeks. He's to dress the garden and keep it. And so this, what he's telling us, is that God had made the building blocks, but these things hadn't yet been put into full potential. They needed human beings, they needed mankind to be able to see them grow and thrive. This is what God made humanity for, for this to be a landscape where production would take place. And that's important for us to understand. It's not sometimes like we see ecologists and environmentalists saying today that humanity has spoiled the landscape. We've destroyed things. We need to allow things to get back to their natural habitat. You know, we don't mow our lawns anymore because we can put out the wildflowers and things. And that's a prairie restoration project. We see those kind of things around here all the time. There's a place for that. But it's not like everything, if, if everything was going to work the way it should, we should have no green grass, we should have no lawns, we should have no cultivation. God made the earth 
at least in part, to be worked, to be tilled, to be brought under human subjection. And there is a beauty to be seen in how humanity embraces and works God's gifts. So it is not a scar on the landscape when we see paved roads, when we see buildings erected and architecture put into place. Maybe the mini malls, but okay, that's, that's a joke. <laughs> but in all seriousness, there is nothing there that says that we shouldn't try to be having commercial and retail and, and different things. It's not a bad thing for us to have houses to live in. It's not a bad thing for industry to take place that is consistent with what God created human beings to do. Even as we should also be aware that human, humanity is capable and is often guilty of doing those things in improper and unstewardship kind of ways. We can do these things, as we've already talked about in previous messages in this series, in ways that can destroy God's creation, that can overtax it. Our greed, our selfishness can bring these things into more destruction than they are productivity. And that's something we must be aware of. When we see the potential of what God made us for, it is something that we need to be willing to embrace, to understand how we fit in to God's plan, whether it is in how we produce food for human consumption, we are able to feed uh, each other, we are able to use these things for commerce to supply, or whether we talk about the way that human beings were going to be made even to reproduce. That's something that happens more and more in our culture, that those things are downplayed, or those things are seen as lesser priorities, as we put more emphasis on things like career or the acquisition of things. It is not wrong to have a career. It is not wrong to acquire material possessions. But Christians need to be thinking as far as what has God placed us here? What does he want us to accomplish? People are important. People are the ones who need to hear about the truth of Jesus Christ, to need to hear the message of hope and salvation. People matter to God. If people matter to God, one of the things that we should be taking into account is what is not only our responsibility to give, give the gospel to people, but how do people procreate? How do people move on in society? How are things established? The nature of marriage, the nature of family, is something that God intentionally creates here in the book of Genesis. And we should not actively dismiss that or put it on a, on a stalled priority or maybe something that we'll do after all these other things take place. Our households need to be environments where we are putting those kind of priorities in front of our children. This is part of what you should do in your responsibility to God. This is what you were created for. And it is not a burden as we talked about in Elizabeth's service yesterday. It's a blessing. There are a lot of societies where human life has been disposable, where, things, where, where children are literally cast off because they are undesirable and unwanted. They, they weren't producing the heirs that they should. Or we, we maybe th 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 see them as people to be kind of put into institutions and managed um, until such a time as they're useful and they can contribute. And we fail to see the potential that God gives us in life. And so yesterday, during Elizabeth's service, we focused on Mark chapter 10, where Jesus says, let the children come. Do not, he says, do not forbid them. Do not prevent them from coming into my presence. Why? This is the ones who believe. They are the ones for whom God's kingdom is intended. They are the ones 
who should have an audience with me. And if you, Jesus says, don't come with the same kind of faith and acceptance, there's not a place for you at the table. We need to believe, we need to embrace not the greed and the selfishness and the acquisition of stuff for its own sake, but to understand God's given us stuff to feed, to nurture, to take care of, and to replenish, and to see these things taking place. Because families matter to God. People matter to God. How do we conceive of our relationship with God? It's in the aspect of a family. We are God's children. He is our Father in heaven. These things matter. These things have potential, and God wants to reconcile us to himself. He wants to bring us into his household. This reminds us, by the way, as we work our way through the passage, that we matter to God. You, as a human being, matter to God. And that's the next point on your outline. As we see in this passage, not really impressing anything else, but what we see that man matters. Humanity matters. We have all these things that are going on. Here it talks about the cultivation hasn't started. The, 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 the weeds and the thistles haven't, uh, haven't manifested themselves. There's still a cycle that's going to see these things grow. We still need God's intervention. We still need God's processes to work. But we are there to complete the picture. Humanity is there to be productive. That's what humanity brings, a sense of completion to God's creation. You do see there as well that God had not caused it to rain. When do we start to see rain? Later on, as God floods the earth, as there is an act of God's judgment against humanity's sin. Humanity, before all these things is taking place, completes God's creation. It is God's design that we are there to fill in the gaps. His creation is not complete until mankind comes in. And that reminds us at the same time as we see the mention of rain. that There is the curse of sin that's going to be brought in as well. The world, God's perfect creation, is disrupted by the choices that human bring, beings bring to our world. As we've already talked about, there is the, the establishment and productivity that we should be bringing, but what humanity introduces into that equation is its misuse, is its mismanagement. Whether it is that we are greedy, we are selfish, and tyrannical with how we manage these things, using them for our own ends, our own profit, or even the laziness that comes with a lack of productivity, or it's not my responsibility. Somebody else will get it done. Those are things that the Bible identifies time and again as sinful, as problematic in human behavior. We know what the fruit of the Spirit is in Galatians. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. But we also see, preceding that in Galatians chapter 5, the works of the flesh, the things that are evident. And those things include some of these things that we're talking about here. The sinful behaviors of, of greed, the sinful behaviors of adultery and infidelity that corrupt what God's good gifts and intentions are for humanity. Instead of productivity, we turn sexuality into a venue for self-expression, for pleasure, for its own end, instead of procreation. I'm not saying that sexuality has no element of pleasure, so that shouldn't be enjoyed in the proper context. But it's, neither should it ever be divorced from the institution that God has created of family, of perpetuating the human race. That is important. That is vital to our understanding of sexuality, of procreation, as it is laid out here in Scripture. And we must sort through those things as Christians, even as we talk through some of the issues that are hitting front and center in our culture and society. 
what we see happening with some of the transgenderism, with some of the, the free sexuality and things that, are, that go on today, those are, we would have to interpret them if we're looking at it from a biblical point of view, as contrary, as rebellious to what God has laid out for us. We don't stand in superior arrogance and judgment of those things, but we also don't casually dismiss these things as optional. If we are going to obey what God says for us, as a Christian, we must understand it starts with those key principles in our lives, that we reserve sex for marriage, that we understand that sexuality, as God created it, is between a married man and a married woman to each other. Those institutions matter. Those categories matter. And so what we see laid out for us here in Genesis chapter 2 is that kind of reality. And we bring it to this conclusion that creation is going to display God's glory through human productivity. Whether we're talking sexual, whether we're talking in how man manages the world and the environment around us, this is the conclusion that we should reach. And that's that final conclusion on your outline. Creation displays God's glory through human productivity. We can disrupt it, and we do disrupt it. And that's why Jesus came, to set us free from the consequences of that sin, to set us free back to fulfill the first uh, thing that we were created for, the first priorities. The first Adam is the one who messed everything up. What sets it right? It's through Jesus, the second Adam that we read about, and we will focus on our attention next week in 1 Corinthians 15 as we talk about the resurrection. The second Adam came as a life-giving spirit to help us understand and embrace the potential that God has always created us for. Father, we do thank you for the hope that we see, even as we see laid out for us in creation, in this story uh, that you have given to us in Genesis chapter 2, the purposes for which you have always intended man to fulfill, the productivity, uh, the purpose that you have given to us, and yet we also see how very early on humanity's uh, Rebellion and selfishness played itself out in our disobedience and our lack of conformity to your commands. We needed to be restored. We needed to be reconciled after that division was created. And so you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to be the second Adam, to be the life-giving spirit, to reconcile us again to you and to restore uh, the, the relationship that we once had with you before the fall. We thank you, Father, for the love that you showed for us by sending Jesus and for the salvation that you offer, that whoever believes as a little child, the same way, who has that same faith, they will have eternal life. They have not perished, but will pass from death into life because of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you for that salvation, for that purpose that you've made possible in Jesus Christ, and we give glory to him. Amen.